This is Twit. I think I've ever, always wondered whether attackers recycle their exploits. Curtis, do they? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> we know from long experience that cyber criminals not only recycle exploits, they are like everyone else doing code development. They recycle code. They use code snippets. They bring out old things. Why? Well, like the best businesses, they're both lazy and cheap. And what researchers are finding that these cyber attackers are routinely using older vulnerabilities to exploit businesses. In some cases, they have found that they're using vulnerabilities that are more than five years old to compromise companies and organizations today. And on May 12th, CISA, the government, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, the FBI, and other U.S. government cybersecurity responders warn companies and agencies that publicly known vulnerabilities are far more commonly targeted by nation-state, cybercriminal, and unattribu unattributed attackers than zero-day vulnerabilities. We all get very excited about zero days, but when it comes down in the pantheon of things to worry about, actually pretty low on the list. What does this mean? It means that failure to patch vulnerabilities. And in the research that they did, everything they warned about was more than a year old, puts organizations at significantly higher risk of compromise. Now, they found that both public and private sectors could degrade some foreign cyber threats to U.S. interests simply by implementing an increased effort to patch their systems. How hard is it to patch the systems? You know, here at Twyet, you've heard us talk about this over and over and over again. Seems like each of us has said something like, patch your systems during multiple blips, bites, and conversations with guests. Patching is the most basic way that companies can improve their cybersecurity posture. However, old versions of software still exist in many IT environments. The problems with patching are highlighted by the fact that one vulnerability on the CISA's top 10 list of commonly exploited vulnerabilities was first disclosed in 2012. I mean, think about it. We have a vulnerability that's now in the second grade, and it's still in the top 10 list of most exploited vulnerabilities. The advisory that came out this week also warned that moving to remote working during the coronavirus pandemic has resulted in additional cybersecurity weaknesses. Are attackers laying off these weaknesses out of the goodness of their hearts? No, they are not. They are taking advantage of these and hitting them hard in multiple ways. March 2020 brought an abrupt shift to work from home rules, regulations, practices, everything. And it necessitated for many organizations rapid deployment of cloud collaboration services. You know, as an example, Microsoft Office 365 and the uh, Google Gmail suite. Malicious cyber actors are targeting organizations whose hasty deployment of Office 365 might have led to oversights in security configurations and therefore a vulnerability to attack. Now, We've talked about Microsoft, and if you look at the list, there are a lot of Microsoft vulnerabilities on the list. Why? Because Microsoft products are very, very popular. It's an old joke uh, made by an American gangster back in the 30s. Someone asked him why he robs banks. That's where they keep the money, he said. Why do people attack Microsoft products? Because those are the products people use. Seven of the top 10 vulnerabilities are in Microsoft Office, SharePoint, Windows, the .NET framework. 
Microsoft's method of sharing data between all of these different products and platforms, which is known as object linking and embedding or OLE, is a common target from attackers. And the top three vulnerabilities targeted by state-sponsored cyber actors from China, Iran, and North Korea and Russia are all related to this technology. You know, there can be significant costs to redeveloping applications. There can be significant costs to updating applications. There can be significant costs to retraining employees to use updated applications. Known, noted. The thing is, there are significant risks to not doing these things. And there can be significant benefits beyond the fact that they're less exploitable. In general, the software brings improved performance and enhanced features. So here, and I'm going to be a, a little bit disingenuous because, Lou, I'm going to come to you. <laughs> um, are you surprised when you hear that so many organizations are still using versions of software and operating systems that are between five and 10 years old. It's interesting because, you know, if I put it my kind of software developer engineering hat on and privacy security enthusiast uh, feelings, I can say, no, I'm, I'm actually very surprised that they're still doing it. But if you look at it from a customer perspective, um, a lot of organizations, they have developed solutions, you know, they spent millions, sometimes millions of dollars developing solutions for their organization, whether it's building software, whether it's building extensions on software, whether it's just deploying solutions to their to their organization. And those solutions work. They work fine. They don't they continue to work. Sometimes they are even just on premise solutions that they feel secure enough. And so when it comes time to determine whether they should upgrade or not, they evaluate the cost. And sometimes the cost is, you know, that plus the original cost they had implemented to deploy it originally. Um, and they haven't really seen any risk to what they've, uh, what they've actually implemented uh, or deployed. So that seems to be a lot of the a lot of the push behind a lot of this. But now you're getting CIOs, CSOs, C CTOs into the system that are saying, no, 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 like let's go just go figure out what it's going to cost and we'll put it in the budget and we'll go do it. Um, and again, a lot of services and software out there today is trying to get people more on to the um, service deployed or constantly incrementally updating things. Like for instance, that's the whole idea between the you know Microsoft's Microsoft 365 or Office 365. Uh, mechanism, which is you get on that and it's just a train. And as the train goes, you'll just frequently get updates, patches and so on that not only improve the experience and add features, but also security. Uh, but again, there's that doesn't apply to a lot of other software that's out in the wild today. So like you could have a really old version of Office like 2003. And again, unless you're patching it and keeping it up to date, um, it's it could be vulnerable. And so am I surprised I like, I guess from a software developer perspective, yes. Like why wouldn't you want to make your organization scare, please? But am I surprised from a implementation perspective? Not really. Well, let me, let me ask you a follow-up question. You know, in this news piece, it talked about OLE and we know that there are lots and lots of APIs, uh, bits and pieces of SDKs that are in use around any corporation software. I mean, you can can look at Microsoft, you can look at Oracle, Salesforce, Google, name one. These things change over time. But from where you sit, when you talk about enterprise software, enterprise applications, homegrown enterprise applications, um, when these APIs, SDKs, other bits and pieces of interface and and software are updated, do they typically come with massive changes that would be required in a homegrown application? Or is that something that's kind of over overblown on a routine basis? 
I don't, they don't necessarily come with large teams. Like Ole, like I'll give you an example. I, my team, one of my teams owns access. So I, one of my engineering teams uh, maintains access. And so there's the old Ole DB interfaces that allow you to interact with a database. Those interfaces haven't changed for a very, very long time. Now the interfaces don't have to change. If we think about it from a modern services perspective, you implement a microservice that has an API or an interface and that interface doesn't have to change. You just keep interacting with it and you can, you know, proxy to other services and do other things under the covers. And that's kind of what Ole does is even though over the years it's been patched and features have been added and performance changes and security changes, the interfaces haven't changed or haven't needed to change, but it's still useful. People still ship applications that interact with the access runtime with it. And they, as long as they're continuing to, to run Windows Update and, and making the, uh, you know, getting security and, and, and feature patches, they're, they're fine. And I think that I think it's a misnomer sometimes to say if I upgrade or update that interfaces are going to change. I mean, it's going to force me to, to, to break. I think if I'm, I've had many of discussions over the 16 years in, in the software business to say that, like, we shouldn't be changing these on customers. They want to continue reliability with our software. So if we're adding features, we just need to add different interfaces. Um, and if they take advantage of it when they want to. And that's been a, a pretty big pattern that we've followed over the years. So that's why a lot of organizations stay fairly reliable, have reliable solutions for such a long time. And this goes even with Windows interfaces and .NET interfaces and uh, you know, JavaScript and Node interfaces and you name it. Um, and so uh, even web browser, web view uh, interfaces. So I think that, you know, it's a misnomer to say that upgrading is going to change things. But I, I, I do think that you'd also have to make sure you update the components that own those interfaces. Well, just real quickly, I want to turn to Brian and ask, you know, you have come at this from a different angle, uh, supporting end users and their departments and organizations. How big a set of resistance have you found to groups wanting to to update? Is, is it really like pulling teeth or... Again, is is the idea that that organizations don't want to update something that is sort of a straw man? Uh, are most organizations out there doing the right thing on on a regular basis? For the most part, when I see people using regular workstations, regular servers, and so forth, um, updating hasn't been a real big problem. It's the embedded stuff, the special purpose machines. Um, like I ran into an orthopedic um, exercise. Well, it's a orthopedic uh, exercise type of equipment, it measures um, leg extensions um, after someone's injured their knee. It was actually at a uh, athletic complex. And that's still running Windows 95, uh, which is really, really frightening. But the problem is they can't change it because the company's gone out of business and the equipment itself was so expensive, they can't afford to change it. Uh, I see the same thing with specialized equipment like gas pumps. I still see um, Windows XP embedded at gas pumps when I see them booting up. So the reality is, in my mind, is, yeah, we're still going to have a lot of stuff. So what I've been doing in those cases when I know that exists is I start zoning them off and putting a lot more IDS IPS on there. Uh, in fact, one of our fans actually started asking me about this type of things. And I said, you know, most firewalls are capable, most enterprise firewalls are capable of doing zones, no problem at all. And so what I do is I just attach zones to a VLAN. And sometimes if I have a really high risk um, public thing, I will actually go and zone off even a single subnet, you know, chop it up and, you know, move it around so that I have the ability to assign IPS IDS so I can look at 100% of the data going back and forth just in case someone's um, managed to punch a lock on a gas pump. It's, I wouldn't say hard. You know, this is something that a lot of these enterprise firewalls can do just right out of the box. And the licensing is not horrible. But, you know, it needs to be done. You need to do something. It's got to give. You know, if you've got, if you're backed against the corner and you can't upgrade, you need to do something else. And my answer is zones. I've, I'm, my home firewall actually has a dozen zones on it. Well, it's interesting that you've got 
problems, you've got solutions, and fortunately, this is brand new, so we'll probably never have to talk about it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the kind of thing that's been around a while, and uh, you can bet that we'll have at least one more conversation about this, um, probably this calendar year. <laughs>